Well, is everyone ready for Thanksgiving? Awesome, awesome stuff, man. Tell you what, we uh, are <laughs> beans, greens, tomatoes, potatoes. <laughs> man, uh, honestly, we're just so excited that you guys would be here with us this morning and uh, celebrating alongside of us. Hey, uh, I do want to mention something before we move because uh, I am unashamedly completely in awe of the presence of God and I believe wholeheartedly in the Holy Spirit and I think he moves in in moments and uh, I think a lot of times we rush away from those moments to get to whatever's next on the schedule. I'm going to tell you that in that little uh, time of transition I had mentioned silencing the voice of uh, depression and suicidal thoughts and there was confirmation someone came up to me and they're like hey man don't move from that because that is for somebody this morning. And I tell you that honestly, I believe the church has been so silent on this issue that is an epidemic and we see a lot of it in this area. We've had some students of our own just personally walk through this with close friends of theirs. And uh, man, I believe wholeheartedly in the mental health care, but I believe even more in the power and the presence of Jesus and when his name is lifted up. And so, uh, man, if you are, literally, if this moment is for you, and I tell you that God would stop everything to hone in on exactly what you're going through, to let you know that you are loved, that you are a son, that you are a daughter, that there is nothing that you are going through currently or that you will go through that God hadn't nailed to a cross and completely destroyed it. And so, uh, man, like, I don't, I don't want to miss that. And, and I know we've got a different scheduled program this morning, but I still believe in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, man, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to just rush. So if, if you're here, man, know that you're not alone. Know that you don't have to be, like, shamed into silence. Golly, man, just know that you can, you can reach out uh, to a place that loves you. Because here's the deal, is this church was never established to just be a country club with good-looking members that pay, to pri- pay the price to sit in these church seats. This is a healing place. It's a, it's a recovery hall. It's a place of restoration and redemption. And so we love you, man. I just want to make that appeal to you. Uh, as a matter of fact, can we just stop real quick and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. God, that you defeated everything, and in everything we include suicidal thoughts and depression and anxiety, Lord, for whatever that strain is that someone is walking through, Lord, you've already completely, completely dealt with it. When you said it was finished, you completed the work of the cross, and for that, we love you, we thank you, and it's in your name. In agreement, the church says, amen and amen. Guys, we're excited about this morning, and honestly, I can tell you that Building up the anticipation of what this message is, honestly, this is our declaration and our plan going forward because the name of the sermon today, it's a standalone message, it's mission-minded. And so mission-minded, this is a church that is committed to missions. The reason we're committed to missions is because there was the great commission that put us into action to tell us to go into all the world preaching the gospel and making disciples. And so we want to do our part, and we've prayerfully considered what that looks like moving forward. And I tell you that there's just seasons and times where God just brings and aligns and puts people together, and then you start sharing your heart for missions, and you start sharing your your vision for how it's going to happen, and then you realize that the answer's in the house and that God provides people that are like, yo, I want to get alongside of that mission and that vision, and I want to walk this thing out with you, and I want to see not just our city reach, not just our state reach, not just our nation reach, but the world reach with the message that is the life-giving message of Jesus Christ, unashamedly, who died on a cross, rose again three days, gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could continue the work that he started. And so Acts 1 Starting in verse 3, I just want to read a couple of verses and uh, kind of let you know how today's going down is I don't just want you to catch my heart for missions. You're going to catch the heart of a couple of people in this church for missions as well. So here we go. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, speaking of Jesus, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, Jesus said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power, everyone say power, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, before we unpack your word, I pray that in fact it is your word that we unpack. We know that it says in your word that it doesn't return void, and so I submit all of my thoughts, my opinions, anyone else speaking on this mic, Lord, let it be your presence through them speaking, that we could hear from your heart, that we could lean into it, and that we could understand that you have put us in position to be a mission-minded people, God. We love you, we thank you, and it's in your name. Amen and amen. So if you are taking notes and following along, the first thing right off the bat is I want you to know that God has equipped us to be his witnesses. He's equipped us to be his witnesses. Well, how has he done that, John? What has he given us? Has he given us like the new strategy? Has he given us like a new 12 DVD series that comes out like every other year? What has he given us? If we go back to the scripture in Acts chapter 1 that we just read, it says that, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and then you'll be my witness. And I tell you that unashamedly, the power that is in the name of Jesus is, a, is attached to the anointing and the authority of the Holy Spirit that he's given us. And so that we could walk out that and to be his witnesses. And then he goes on to tell us, see, the thing about Jesus and the kingdom of God is that it's, it's very much an advancing kingdom that doesn't just stop or settle in Jerusalem. It pushes past to Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. And so Jesus, which I believe, lays out this just uh, almost this progression of advancement of the gospel and the kingdom. And he says to his disciples that it's going to start in Jerusalem, that they got to stay there to receive power, and then there'll be witnesses there, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so I just want to unpack a few things with you this morning about what the strategy at the crossing looks like to be a mission-minded church. And I tell you that a mission-minded church is a dangerous church. The reason it's a dangerous church is because it's a church that has established the purpose for which we, we, we live, we breathe, we walk, we're established. See, the purpose of this church was never intended to just make Sunday morning something you enjoyed coming and doing. The intention of this church from the word go was to find life, live life, and give life because we were to be put in position to receive from God, to give to others. Next week we're talking about radical generosity coming in the Thanksgiving message. But I want you to know that the reason that we become a dangerous church is that we're a church that's no longer okay sitting in the four walls that call this place the crossing. That we're a church that advances the mission of God by going into the co-mission with him saying, you know what God, we're going to do this because you said that we will be your witness. If you catch that in the verse we just read, it says you will be my witness. It didn't say you may be or you might be or you could be. It says you will be. And so you'll be my witness when you receive this power. And I believe he gives us the strategy and the formula to take this advanced territory and continue to build. See, the problem I think happens is that we read that and we love the backwards back to the city version, right? Like, like, like maybe we could read it and... We would say, okay, you'll be my witnesses in both the remotest part of the earth, Samaria, Judea, and Jerusalem. Why? Because a lot of us are just like captivated by the remotest parts of the earth, right? I mean, like who wouldn't want to be called to like the Bahamas? <laughs> Come on, Lord. Actually, I really do feel right now <laughs> that the Lord is saying, <laughs> John, go to Bahamas and then move to Jamaica. No, I'm just kidding. Um. But I think a lot of times what happens is we want to reach, like, like, hear me on the seriousness of this. We want to reach the remotest part of the earth, but we won't take time to reach out to our neighbor. And so what happens is we'll do all this stuff to go thousands of miles away to meet people that we'll never see again, but we don't even know who our neighbor is or what they're going through or what they're dealing with because the attraction is at the remotest part of the earth when God's instructions were stay home first. Stay home first. And I tell you that my first calling in ministering and in doing ministry is not to this church. It's to my family at home first. That if my family is falling apart but all this is going well, then I'm doing something wrong. And so, like, what we want to do is we want to kind of lay this strategy out and let you know some vehicles and the way that we're going to reach this mission. And so if you're taking notes, it starts in Jerusalem. So what does Jerusalem represent? Well, Jerusalem represents our city. Our city. It's Dothan. It's Cottonwood if you live there. It's Wicksburg if you live there. It's Headland if you live there. It's Ashford or any other area that I might have missed. It's our city. Graceville. Shout out to Graceville. Throwing some grace in the ville. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. And so our first calling is to our city. And can I tell you, as a pastor, I've been challenged with this call to reach Jerusalem. 
And so the thought of reaching Jerusalem is that Jerusalem doesn't just, uh, it doesn't just limit the territory to who comes and worships with us on Sunday morning. I mean, Jerusalem is our home. It's our neighbors. It's the city that God planted us in. You know, it's funny. I go to these, uh, like I, I've been to like pastor meetings and stuff, and you know, where everyone meets for the first time, and it's almost like, is anyone, if you've been in ministry, you know how this goes. You go, to the, you go to the leadership ministry, and then they meet you, and they ask like who you are, where you're from, what city are you planted in, and how many, how many people are you running, right? Like how many you got at your church? Well, can I just be completely honest with you? When God burned in my heart that we were to reach Jerusalem, our city, Dothan, Alabama, when I would answer that question, I wouldn't answer it based off of who comes here on Sunday morning. I would answer it based off of the population that's called the Wiregrass. And so then they're like, how many are in your church? Well, I'm not really sure about that, but I can tell you that there's close to 100,000 people that call the Wiregrass home, and God's positioned us there to take care of our city. So, you know, like I'm part of the, the laborers that have been put in the vineyard to reach hundreds of thousands of people in the Wiregrass area. And if they come on Sunday morning with us, great, but my heart is to reach every area and opportunity in our city regardless of where they sit on Sunday morning. I have church at the barber shop every Friday at 10 o'clock when I get my hair cut. I do, man. I have church at least once a week at Shoney's when I eat a breakfast buffet there. <laughs> Sometimes three times, let's just be honest. <laughs> we have church on Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock when there's a men's breakfast that meets at Atlanta Bread. And I tell you, see, the, the heart for our city in reaching it isn't to just limit it to who we talk to on Sunday morning. See, honestly, like I told our dream team today, I am completely okay with empowering other leaders in this church to go and advance the gospel, even if it's not my name on it. Because I don't care if I get any credit. I want him to get all the credit, right? And so we want to be a part of that. And so our city, what are some things that we can do to reach our city? Just to give you a few things, one thing that we have in place is our life groups. And so if you only attend church on Sunday mornings, you're taking 25% of what we do and enjoying that. Imagine what would happen if you took the whole pie home, you know what I'm saying? There's three other things that we do. We do life groups, we do next steps, which is really that track to help you discover your purpose, and then we do dream team. We serve, we take ownership in this house. Really, that's what the dream team is. It's incredible that I can meet churches and talk about volunteerism and the church of volunteers. You know, like our Sunday morning attendance, typically for average over the last three years, it's been 148 people, and of those 148, 107 call themselves dream teamers. Like, that's incredible to me. I would much rather have a church full of people that have taken ownership in the vision of God in this house, serving this house, not serving me, but the name of God that's on this house, and then you would see the fact that there's a difference between an owner and a renter in the vision. And so we have owners in this house that have said, you know what, I'll pick up trash because this is my house. Like, I'll, I'll straighten up chairs because it's my house. Like, I'll do whatever I can to be a part of what God's doing through this, and so we're super excited about that. And we have life groups. Life groups are put in place to do life together. Like, we believe that life groups is the vehicle that allows us to reach our city. In life groups, we have one hub completely designated to missions and outreach. And truth be told, I think it's just starting to move into a bigger place to where we're really going to have to be a church that empowers more people to carry out more missions and outreach opportunities. And the awesome thing is, is that God has this way of working in and through seasons. And in a lot of times, there are seasons where God's stretching, grow, he's growing, and, and he's pulling things out of leaders. And maybe these leaders have experienced some frustration in life and really just trying to find their fit when they realize that, like, man, it's been here. I can serve out of the place that God has me planted. And, uh, man, uh, for life groups, first people are going to come up and talk for just a few minutes. We have Callie and Alejandro Gerardo. Y'all come on up here. Y'all give it up for them. I will say about this couple, if you don't know these two, Callie's been with us for a hot minute. Like, I mean, I think I've been around for, what, eight or nine years, and you've probably been here for about seven of them. And you just kind of showed up. The first time we have absolutely, uh, honestly, the first time we met Callie, it wasn't at church on a Sunday. It was when we did an outreach project uh, on a Saturday. Barbecue, and barbecue plates. plates. We just passed out barbecue plates. We had a, it was a bunch of young adults. We didn't have a budget. We were just kind of balling on hopes and dreams and faith, right? And so uh, we called a bunch of young adults to our house, and we were like, yo, on this night, we're putting all of our money in the middle of the floor. However much is there is what we're going to work with. And, uh, you know, we called grandmas. We called parents. <laughs> we did whatever we could, and we were able to get about $1,500 between, like, a bunch of kids under 21 years old with no money and part-time jobs. And we bought a bunch of Boston butts. We smoked them, and uh, 
we smoked them in the ground. <laughs> and so we, we gave them out down the city. I think it was like some over... <laughs> what is he talking about? We, so, uh, so Callie was there for that. Um, the other thing about Callie was that she, she really has always had a heart for missions. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit about it. But, but I want you to know that like, I stand behind her and Alejandro. And I believe in their heart. I believe in, in what God's doing in and through them and what he's creating, mission opportunities and things like that. So for the season that we call right now, um, this is our mission and outreach directors. And, like, we're going to follow them and, 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 and just empower them. So here, you talk. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, I literally am nervous because I've not been behind a microphone or on stage in, like, two years, I think. So I'm Callie. This is my husband, Alejandro. Um, and I, let's see, I went to on my first trip to Uganda in 2012. Um, in high school, I started a group called Invisible Children. I brought it to our high school, and we did, like, book drives and different things like that. And that was to help kids in Uganda, and I'd never been, didn't know anything about it, just thought it was really cool. So I was like, hey, I can do this. And so in 2012, I actually had the opportunity to go to Uganda. And since then, I've gone every year. Um, and then in 2016, I actually decided to move over, which is through a ministry called Benjamin House. I think some of you were probably here when I spoke on that and talked about that. I actually met Alejandro through the ministry, um, but little side story, backstory on that. I um, moved to Uganda hoping to live there for a year, and think, I thought I could do it completely. I was like, I can do this. This is going to be awesome. I got there. I was there for probably five months and started facing, like, super bad spiritual warfare, and it was I was facing fear and anxiety every single day, and it got to the point where I couldn't handle it because I didn't have, like, a community around me. I had, of course, there's, you know, I had Alejandro, I had the team, I had all these people, but there were no women. There were no women, there were no Americans, so it's, it's a culture shock. It's completely different. So I moved home, and, I mean, I still walk through the anxiety, but most of the fear is gone, so praise God, because that was terrible. Um, so now we're really excited um, because we're here locally, and we're learning that it is about plowing the field here before you go out. So I'm going to let... Alejandro introduce himself because he doesn't talk much. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to reach my quota for today just being up here. But, um, yeah. So, a little backstory. I, a lot of you guys don't know me. You guys know me through Cali. But, um, a little backstory. When I was eight, or I was born in Mexico, I moved to South Carolina when I was eight, and I lived there for 15 years. So, then that was in 2016, is when we both moved through um, Benjamin House to Africa. And obviously through that move, I was blessed with a beautiful wife. And so, but um, ever, like very early in my walk with um, Jesus, and when I say very early, it was like the next week that, that I had, that I had um, accepted him, um, I was already serving. I was, um, you know, I know it's little, but like picking up chairs in our church or, you know, going to the homeless shelter. But, um, and so through that, like uh, my foundation for serving was kind of set. Um, I was you know, like I said, going to the homeless shelter, but, um, what am I trying to say? Um, so serving's all I've known, and, um, the pastor at the time poured through, poured to me through serving, so, like, we were, like I said, doing all that, and then we started kind of locally, so, like, she started internationally, and then her heart kind of changed into, uh, you know, okay, we've, now I've got to serve the local church, but for me, it was the opposite of that. I started locally, you know, South Carolina, we would go to Tennessee and do roofing and all that, and and so, like I was telling her this morning, it's really cool that we get to have this opportunity to do this together and kind of lay the foundation down for serving, and for me, serving is almost a part of worship, yeah. you know, that's how I, that's how I worship, because um, obviously I'm a quiet guy and I like doing all the background <laughs> stuff instead, so, so it's good, and so we're very excited about this position that we have and the opportunity that we have. They're being uh, super modest, and so uh, we love that. But uh, can I just be honest? Like, Alejandro, you don't say many words, but when you speak, there's a lot of intentionality behind it. And so, like, I've had an opportunity to just sit in life group settings and just to hear his heart and um, the dynamic of them two together, man. They're, uh, they're going to do some amazing things locally and just kind of heading up efforts that we're going to lay out as a church 
uh, like globally. And so we're super excited about that. So we have life groups. It's a way that we reach our city. And so they've been leading one. Life groups are actually coming to a pause. They'll start back up in the first week of February. But they led one called Do Something Church. And to be honest with you, they just took the reins and ran with it. Because at the time, uh, I was supposed to lead Do Something Church. And then uh, God just positioned us here to lead the church. And I was like, okay, man, well, we're still going to do it. And so um, if you know me, my favorite answer is yes. I'm just going to keep going and I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and then God just sent some people alongside of us that were like, hey, like, like I know that you committed to doing this because you really want to see it, but, but I'm here and I'm ready. And this is the season that God's really going to use me and my husband. And so, Callie, we're super thankful for what God's doing. Another way that we can reach our Jerusalem, our city, is through community relationships. You see, like, we're not the church that just has to have our name on everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, we'll come alongside and partner and do some things in our community, even if Church of the Crossing doesn't get a lick of credit. Because at the end of the day, it's advancing the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the crossing. And so in doing that, we have a lot of community relationships. And the cool thing is, is these first people I'm about to call out, is they're actually in-house relationships that have been here with us for a while. And I'm going to let them tell their story and maybe hear a little bit of their heart. But Jared and Marcy Harrison, y'all come on up. Uh, they, uh, they actually just have an incredible story. They run, a, they run an organization, a nonprofit called Hannah's Gifts of Hope. And I'm going to let them talk a little bit more. Uh, God was stirring something in my heart of what we could do. And, and it was crazy because he was stirring it in y'all's heart. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Um, good morning. Uh, we are blessed and honored that John would allow us to come up and share a little bit of our story. Um, and we are, I mean, we're, we're a crossing family and crossing people. We've been through the days of, you know, it was time to wrap it up when you smelled popcorn at the movie theater. We've tearn up and torn down. We were at Skate Center for, for a minute, and then we've been blessed to be here. Um, and if, if you have been here at The Crossing, you know um, our three children. Um, it doesn't take long to know that Chandler's in a room, or Madeline, or Mason. And God has blessed us with a beautiful family. Um, but if just for a moment we could share... Um, uh, about the miracle that God gave us in 2005 and our daughter Hannah Grace. And so um, 2005 was a very tumultuous year for us. Um, we didn't live anywhere near or have a community like we have at the Crossing now. Um, we were serving at a church in Maryland. Uh, we were 13 hours away from family. Um, 2005 was a very hard year for us in the fact that we lost um, Marcy's stepdad. Um, we lost my grandmother an aunt that was very close to us, my brother-in-law. Um, I was laid off of my full-time job and was only working part-time at the church. Um, have I missed anything? I mean, it was, we, yeah, Marcy lost a student. She's a special ed teacher. And so it was a very, very hard year for us. Um, we, were, we were serving at the church and, and trying to do what we felt God had called us to do, but on December the 8th of 2005, God gave us our firstborn child. Um, we named her Hannah Grace, and she was a, a true blessing in our life. Um, even by her name, Hannah means grace. Um, it was a double portion of grace in our life. And so we could always look back and say that we never had the worst year of our life because God gave us that gift. Um, we, we were blessed um, in the time that we had her. Uh, in May of 2008, she was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor um, in which we went through probably five, six brain surgeries, uh, two full rounds of chemo. Um, we, did, we had radiation as well. And um, in August of 2010, the Lord called her home. Um, I don't know why. I don't have the answers to why. Um, one day I will, but will, will it even matter then? Um, I know that I was blessed in the years that we had her. It was an honor for me to be her dad, and I know Marcy feels the same way about having her in our life. Um, but through that, and, and through that transition of, of us just needing a place to heal and to finding a home, um, we found Church of the Crossing. Um, we were able to come in and to allow God to do a work in our lives um, and in our family's life to be able to find um, hope. And I'll let Marcy share a little bit about what we've done since then. So after Hannah Grace passed away, we had, we had been surrounded by love and support 
And God just laid the verse on 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So we wanted to share um, what we had received with the other families that were going through childhood cancer in this area. And so we started an organization called Hannah's Gifts of Hope. Um, and through that, we've been able to reach out to families, and we've always been supported by The Crossing. And um, we do something for her birthday every year. Um, her birthday is December the 8th, and God laid it on my heart after we served at the harbor with our church. You'll hear a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, that that's where we needed to partner this year for her birthday. Um, so we are collecting clothing and craft items and toys that we will be able to distribute through the harbor to people in the Dothan area. It's truly just been an honor to just be part of your guys' journey and, and to watch God heal and continue to heal through every gift that they give out. And so it was awesome. Like, we, we really, like, that's community relationships that, they come, and even in, in their source of what they've walked through, they've said, you know what, this is a platform for us to help others find a little piece of hope and, 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 and compassion. And so um, that's what we're doing, man. Uh, for her birthday, we're going to celebrate as a crossing, and there will be some boxes. There's a box out there now at the tent. So if you guys have clothes, uh, we want to we bring clothes. We want to bring, uh, you know, school uniforms and things like that and just be a blessing in our community. Another community relationship that just seasons and timing and God bringing stuff together is a uh, – Man, a, a guy uh, started coming to our church uh, like a month ago, maybe two months ago, and uh, we grabbed coffee together and finds out that uh, I find out that he's, uh, he's on staff over at the Harbor Church. And if you know nothing about the Harbor, you are missing out on a blessing in the middle of downtown Dothan. And so uh, we have one of the dire assistant director, Joel Williams, is, uh, calls us home now, and so we're stoked. So come on, Joel, man, you come up here, give it up for him. I'm going to let him talk a little bit about the Harbor See, really, the, the heart behind all of this, again, is just letting you see the vehicles that God is just lining up, ready to just be sent out into our community. And so here's another one, man. We're blessed that you're here. Go ahead, man. Hey. I'm Joel. Uh, my title, which isn't important at all, is I'm the assistant director at the Harbor, the Harbor Church, the Harbor House. Really, it's just the Harbor, but people know us as a lot of things. Um, God has just been doing an incredible um, work in my life in the past year and a half. If you would have saw me two years ago, the idea of me being on staff at a church or in ministry is just absurd, really. I'm from western New York, like uh, how I ended up in Dothan. Like, my parents live in Slocum, and God was like, you should move to Slocum. And I was like, tomatoes. So, <laughs> you know, like, so here we are. Um, but the harbor is an incredible ministry. I made it really clear to John, like, you know, I don't want this to be, the harbor is the only place to serve in Dothan because it certainly isn't. Um, it is a ministry in downtown Dothan that is a wonderful blessing to the people that serve there first. I think really, like, you'll go and you'll serve if you ever do come serve, and I think you'll have more poured into you than you could ever pour out. Um, we make it very clear, and we want to make a point to say that we will not be a church that adopts a form of godliness but does not work in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think that's why, not because we've decided to say that, but because we've acted that out, that God has moved in power and in his spirit through the harbor in the city of Dothan. Um, you know, I have like the spiel, right, that I give people when they tour, which is I could give you all the numbers. Like we've baptized 74 people in the last eight months. I, we've done, I think, roughly, based on the amount of people we serve on average, we did 17,000 meals this year. But we're not going to, like, I don't want to stand up here and major in the minors. Like, we're not going to sit here and say, wow, look at the 5,000 people Jesus fed, but then not talk about the importance of the gospel. Because the reality is that there is a darkness in the city of Dothan. It's in your families, it's in your friends. It's not just downtown where there's poverty and people are living off of welfare checks. That's just where I happen to minister. The reality is in your backyard, there is a force at work 
spiritual principalities that want people to die and be separated from Jesus Christ for eternity. And we operate in the urgency that we don't want that. That's what the harbor is. Um, you may know us as the homeless church. We serve homeless people because they're people and they're God's children. And they probably happen to stay outside near where our building is. Um, we're an inner city church. At a certain point, if we had 30 kids come to our kids program, 95% of them would come without a parent or a grandparent. If they came on a Saturday, it was probably the one meal that they got that day. Um, there's a lot of hurt, but the reality is it doesn't matter if your addiction is crack cocaine or if you make $250,000 a year and you can't stop looking at pornography. Your spiritual impoverishment is the same as that person addicted to crack cocaine. Um, and that's our heart at the harbor. Um, where we are is a hard place, but it's a hard world. Um, and God wants to speak life and speak truth into the city of Dothan. He wants to transform it through the power of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And there are other ministries in Harbor. I just, you know, Courtney and I started coming here like a month, month and a half ago. We actually Googled, this is what we would do. We were searching for churches, and we would Google churches in Dothan and go through the list. And we're like, the crossing, we're millennials, let's try that. <laughs> and like, I don't, like, it's just a totally, like the Holy Spirit has just aligned this to this season of growth here at Church at the Crossing, um, but also at growth through us at the Harbor and other ministries in Dothan too. So I'm just humbled that I would even be asked um, to speak. Um, so thank you. If you have any questions, if you have any questions on how you can serve, um, please come see me after service. Um, there's a lot of ways you can serve if you choose to serve through us if you feel led to. So thank you. awesome stuff and here's the thing about community relationships too is uh i went to a social injustice panel that a guy named matthew barnett was sitting on and matthew barnett he uh, wrote a book called the church that never sleeps has one of the largest ministries on skid row in la and uh he made this statement that has always stuck with me and it was um the person willing to outlast the other force on the street corner is the one that'll win the neighborhood and so this community relationship really is a consistency on our part. See, we don't want to be the church that's known to just show up and take a bunch of pictures and say we served once. We want to be the consistent force that will stand on a corner and win a block for Jesus so the drug dealer doesn't win it, right? And so it's kind of these consistent community relationships that God's like building and surrounding the crossing with. And so we'll have opportunities as a whole church to go serve over at the harbor. But even as individuals, man, like go see Joel. There's literally any time that you would want to. You could go on a Saturday morning, and as much as you want to bless others, you'll, leave, you'll, you'll really leave filled up in the blessing that it was. So in Jerusalem, our city, we've got life groups, community relationships. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And so we just want to partner in our city, in our community, in our state, in our nation to really make a difference and make an impact. Because, see, the big thing about buy-in to a church isn't how cool we can get on Sunday morning. It's really how much we can give out as a result of us coming together. Like, I don't want Church at the Crossing to be labeled like, oh, yeah, that's real. Kind of like you'll, you'll see skinny jeans and tattoos on the stage. No, like you'll see the heart of God in action through our city because the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do so. And, yeah, some are younger and some do have tattoos. But the fact is, is that what we see here is a generational church, God calling us all together. It's amazing that we have a strong influence of millennials, but the picture that I see is the table that I used to eat at growing up where it was uh, myself present, my dad present, my grandparents present, eventually my kids present, and the kids, kids, kids present. See, that's the table of God. That's what the church should look like. Like, we're not just going to appeal to millennials. We want every generation represented because every generation will be represented in the kingdom. And so we're going to reach our city, Jerusalem, with community relationships, with life groups, just taking ownership of the block that you live on like for real man like I want to be a mission minded people that see every opportunity uh, before us and then as as it expands and we we take Jerusalem and territory well then you move to Judea and Samaria well what does that represent it represents our nation you see I, I think the cool thing is is that God calls people to every part that God calls people to like stateside missions 
that God calls people to just stay in inner cities and to stay in the city you're planted in. And so that represents our nation. The next part is the remotest part of the earth that represents our world. And so we have an opportunity to reach not just our city, but the nation that we're in, the United States. Can I tell you, it's crazy to think that we live in the United States where we think we send missionaries all over the world, but the fact is, is they're starting to send them to us. I mean, has anyone ever realized that? That there are other nations that are looking at the United States and saying, ha, if only they knew the life-giving message of Jesus Christ and the power that is in the Holy Spirit. And so they're sending their missionaries to us. You know, I had an opportunity to go minister in Michigan at Dearborn, Michigan. Like, my dad took me on a mission trip there. Does anyone know where Dearborn, Michigan is? Did you know that Dearborn, Michigan is the largest Muslim-populated city outside of the Middle East, and it's here in Michigan? And so we had an opportunity to go minister there. So we want to join and partner to reach our nation and to reach areas, inner cities, the, the, the left coast, the west coast, whatever. I'd love to go there because I want In-N-Out Burger. i got to try it. <laughs> Yo, five guys? So anyways, um, the cool thing about reaching our nation and our world, I was really praying. And for those that don't know, at the crossing, we're eight years old, and we've been talking about going on missions trips for quite some time. And I really felt like, God, this is the season, this is the time. We're going to declare that this is the, this is the, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. And the Lord gave me this plan of like a three-phase implementation of stage one, stage two, stage three. Stage one would be this summer. We're going on a missions trip. But here's the deal. It's the first one we've ever gone on. So let's keep it stateside. Let's reach our nation. Let's figure a state that we can go in the United States and reach. And then I was like, okay, God, so we'll do that. And then maybe phase two would be that we would cross the borders, maybe go to Mexico or Canada. And then maybe after that, stage three would be that we would go to our world. We would go beyond Mexico and Canada, hopefully the Bahamas or something. I don't know. Wherever the Lord calls us, we'll go. Lord, here I am. Send me. Um, <laughs> but I was praying like, okay, God, like here's the plan, but what's the vehicle? Like, how are we going to do this, God? And so I reached out, I, I emailed the ARC, I emailed a couple of other association-related churches, I, I just emailed other pastors, and really never, uh, like, settled in on a partnership with a ministry. And then in September, we get a new member of the church that just kind of called us home, and they, they ended up being here. And I remember the Lord used to always say that the answer is always in the house. And so I, I, I met, uh, actually, it's crazy, because Sydney. Sydney was uh, the hostess at, uh, the hostess, is that the position? At O'Charlie's, and me and my wife went to go eat, because uh, shout out to O'Charlie's, all you can eat chicken fingers, you know what I'm saying? I believe that's Thursday. If y'all need to eat well, stick around me, I'll help you out. Wednesday, free pie, but anyways, back to the point. O'Charlie's, my wife and I are just enjoying lunch, we're walking in, and she's, uh, she's taking us to our table, and she said, so here's a cool fact, I go to your church. <laughs> And we're like, oh, awesome. And so then uh, she's just talking to us about how she ends up here. And she's like, it's crazy that you would be here today because my roommate has been trying to get your information to email you because we really felt that we were supposed to reach out. See, she works for this group called Praying Pelican Missions. And I'm like, what? So God has been working even if I can't see him work to make connections happen. And she's like, yeah, so... Um, like, you know, could we maybe get your information and pass it over to Jenna so Jenna can meet with you? And so uh, I reached out. Jenna, re I don't remember who called who first. But anyways, we made that initial contact. And she comes and just shares her heart about praying Pelican, uh, Pelican praying missions. Pray, praying Pelicans. Boom, put it up there. Let me see it. There we go. Um, and it was incredible because the whole time I'm hearing her talk, and Joel Sewell was actually in the room with me. And she was just talking and going through her heart and really just telling us, like, this is, this is the deal. This is how we're going to do it. This is, this is our heart, and we want to partner. And, uh, again, if you know me, my favorite answer, especially when God confirms, is, yeah, let's make this thing happen. And so we are forever grateful for the relationship that God's starting with Praying Pelican Missions. I'm going to let Jenna talk a little bit more about it, and then we'll reveal where we're going this summer. So uh, come on, Jenna. Y'all give it up for her. So the All You Can Eat Chicken Fingers is on Tuesday. All right, Tuesday. Um, Sydney wanted to make sure you got that right. Is Catfish on Thursday, I think? All right. Uh, so there's that. But yeah, we want to take care of you. Uh, my name's Jenna. I've been working with Praying Pelican since April. I served in the Bahamas this summer for two straight months, so I can take you there. Um, you will not know you're in the Bahamas. I lived in India for a year and a half, and in the Bahamas, I saw some of the worst poverty I've ever experienced. 
the slums there at any point in time can be burned down by the government because of just some crazy stuff going on. I can talk to you about that if you want to hear about it. Um, but in India, the slums are fine because they're most likely not going to be torn down. Um, so you think Bahamas, Atlantis, but let me tell you, Bahamas is a place to pray for. Um, but praying pelican, who are we, what do we do? Uh, first, the name, strange, right? Pelicans. Uh, anyone who comes on a trip with us, we call pelicans. But the name came from a legend, an old wives tale, um, was that the mama pelican would sacrifice herself to her kids if there was no food. It is not true, but that's what we go with, because um, it's a legend, wives tale. But just like Christ sacrificed himself for us, the mom sacrificed herself for her kids, so we want to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of the gospel. So that's where we get praying. Believers are supposed to pray, in case you didn't know. And missions go into all the world. Um, so that's our name. We use the local church as our base. And so everything we do, we do through a local church in one of our locations. We've got about 26 locations right now. We grow every year where we have a connection, we go. Next year, we're branching into India, and I'm super excited about piloting those trips. This upcoming year, I'm going to be in the Native American reservations serving the Navajo tribes. So I'm super pumped about that. It's an international trip within the states because their culture and the way they believe and the way they operate is different than what we do here because their government is different, the way they work is different, all of that's different. So it's just an exciting time. I get to go, I get to make the reservations my own. I get to go in January and meet all of my partners after my mission trip to the Bahamas. Um, it's great, it's great, I'm excited. So we do everything through the local church. We have three pillars, uh, long-term relationships. Our goal as PPM is that every year, Church at the Crossing, where you're gonna partner, you'll soon find out, um, every year you would go back there. You would invest your money wisely. You're not just gonna throw your money here, you're not gonna throw your money there, but every year you're investing. Just like Hannah's gift of hope, you're investing in that. You're serious about that. We're called to be frugal with our money and to be mindful of what the Lord has given us, and so that's what we want to do. Sustainable ministry. Um, we don't do anything on our own. Everything we do, like in the Bahamas New Haitian Church, everything we do there is through New Haitian Church, if that's who that team is partnering with. So when that team leaves, that church has done it, and the community sees it that that church has done all of that work. That way, it continues, because it doesn't stop when you leave. You're there to encourage the church. You're there to get things started and kind of get the ball rolling and leave that church equipped to keep going. And then genuine partnerships, it's a partnership. It's family. Every year you go back, every other year you go back, you invest, and you become a family. We have one team who goes to one church every year on this one girl's birthday. So every year they throw her a birthday party. And so that's what it's about. It's about partnership. And all of our pastors go through pastors' conferences all summer long. Like this past summer, I talk to my pastors constantly. I'm like, all right, what do you believe? What are you doing for the kingdom? What do you believe about this? Is, this? is this what the Bible says or is this what the Bible says? Making sure that they're legit. Okay, we don't just partner with people because they have a church. We partner with people who are kingdom-focused because that's what we want to be. Um, so I don't really get a microphone much, so I like to take what I can when I have one. Um, so Luke... Four, sorry, um, Luke 4.43, Jesus has gone around, he's been healing people, he's been talking to people, and Luke 4.43, he's leaving, going to a desolate place, moving on to the next location, and all these people are like, whoa, 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 sir, you need to come back here, you're not done. And Jesus says to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And that's what I do. Um, I firmly believe that I'm not, I don't know how long I'll be in Dothan. I'm here for now. I tell people probably about five years. He could call me to a new location next month. I have no idea. I just go where the wind takes me um, because that's what I was called to do. But if you look at the Israelites and all the different tribes, each different tribe had a different goal. Each different tribe had a different job. The Levites were the one that handled Ark of the Covenant and all of that stuff. And all the other tribes had their shepherding. They, they did crops. They did all these different things. So we're each called to a different part of the kingdom, right? Just like Pastor John said, the two different kingdoms we have. Um, but we're all called to preach the gospel, because that's what Jesus did. And we're called to be like Jesus, right? All right, cool, cool. Um, so know that you have an active part in this. And this morning I was praying about it and just like, all right, Lord, 
Luke 4.43, that's cool. It's kind of like a verse I, I tell people whenever they're like, well, you can do stuff in Dothan. You can do stuff. I'm from Headland. You can do stuff in Headland. Well, you're 100% correct. I can. And when I'm home, I do. I'm actively serving because that's what I'm called to do. But I am also called to other places. Um, and so I was praying. I was like, all right, Lord, how can I be an encouragement? Like, serve here, serve other places. Uh, well, my devotion this morning was on the end times. Shocker. Um, and so, like, I don't think we're in the end times right now. I think we're getting close to it. But I think it's going to be a whole lot more chaotic than what it is right now. Personal opinion. Um, and I was in Second Thessalonians and just reading all this end time stuff and all these books of the Bible. I didn't realize it was mentioned. And I was like, all right, Lord, how can I encourage them? And I want to encourage you the fact that they're coming. Uh, I know people I've shared the gospel with who have denied it and who will not be with me in heaven. And that breaks my heart. But we have the opportunity to go to Dothan, to Alabama, to the U.S., and to other countries to share the gospel because the end times are coming. It's not something that might happen. It's something that will happen. And just thinking about people who struggle with suicide and depression, like when you were talking about this, it kind of it hit my heart because it hits close to home. Um, but look, that's just Satan. And he wants you to think that you're not important in this fight for the kingdom, but you are. Because every child of God has an active part in sharing the gospel and getting people to hear his name. And you don't know if your time has come yet or if you've met the person you're supposed to share the gospel with yet. And so know that you're important and you're an active part of this. And if you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit power living within you. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 says... And then the lawless one, Satan, the dragon, Antichrist, all of his names, um, one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. That's with, like, that's no actions. That's simply him breathing, like, our words. When we breathe, we need to breathe Christ. Um, And I just thought that was a really cool way, at least in my head, this is what I'm learning this morning, guys, um, to see Christ in that. So that's praying Pelican's goal is to go into the world, whether it's our hometowns, one of our locations, or just an airport along our journey to where we're going, and share the gospel um, and connect people with the local church. So they know they're important. They know that Christ died for them, but he didn't just die for them. He rose from the grave, because if you don't share that part, you haven't shared the gospel, Um, and that he loves you. He really does. So we're excited about this partnership with Church at the Crossing. We're excited about what PPM is going to do for you guys, what you guys are going to do for us and just what you're going to do for your location. All right, thank you. So man, so here we are. Mark 16, 15 says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. See, when I say that we're going to be a mission-minded church, the mission doesn't just stop here. It really starts here. And so the fact that it starts here is that we want to be good stewards of, of the vision that God's giving us to reach our city our nation, and our world. And so I just kind of wanted to take time to give you guys a glimpse to what kingdom perspective looks like. See, because at the end of the day, like, I, I really do want you to know that if Church of the Crossing receives no credit for anything we do in advancing the kingdom, I would be perfectly okay with it. Because at the end of the day, the only name that gets lifted up is the name of Jesus. And if we serve that name, and if that's the name that this church is established and centered and submitted to, well, then in the end of of it all, he gets all the glory. One thing that the Holy Spirit really just shared with me in praying about being a mission-minded people is that, uh, you know, God God told me, because can I just be honest with you, there was a time in my own life where I was like, okay, God, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. Like, God, where are you calling me? And I was so excited about just tackling everything in front of me. And see, the cool thing about God is that God calls us to be a people, not just a person. And so God really just began to show me that like, okay, John, I don't need you to do everything. I just need you to do something. And what I need you to do is stay planted in the field that I plowed and prepared for you because it'll be from that place that you can experience and you can see and you can impact the whole world. Not because you're going, John, but because we're raising up an army of believers that'll advance the kingdom of God if you're faithful with the field that I planted you in.
Can I tell you that there's been times over the last nine years that I've been searching and wondering, God, what's next for me and Brandy? Where would you have us go? Surely you're calling us to something else. Surely you're calling us to lead and be pastors in a place like, like that you're preparing for us. And, and I really struggled with my identity as a pastor because like I, I really like I, I put it in a, in a location, right? I was like, I won't be a lead pastor until I'm at this location. And then I even started to wonder and pray, like, okay, God, like, would you call me to Virginia Beach? Because, like, that, that makes sense. Like, we have friends there. We were, that was home at one point. Would you call us to Mobile, Alabama? Where would you have us? And God led me to this verse. It was actually two years ago in January. So just being honest with you, is that okay this morning? Psalms 92. Verse 12, it says, the righteous flourish like the palm tree. I was like, okay, this is for me because I'm Samoan, right? It's a palm tree. Surely this is the Lord. And grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. When I read that, the Lord said, John, you've been so concerned with planting You've overlooked the fact that I've already planted you. I tell you that like, when I tell you that my field and my Jerusalem and where I'm planted is the city of Dothan, unless God himself uproots us and moves us, like my heart breaks for the wire grass. Like, like, like my heart is so into Jerusalem that I pray that God sends people who have a heart for Judea, Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth. And then the Lord said, John, you'll experience the world from the dot. And I saw this dot on a map. It was like, wow, like I could truly have an impact all over the world from the dot, from Dothan. Because this is where God would have us. That we would be the church that God's called us to be, a mission-minded church. You know, I said earlier that a mission-minded church is a dangerous church. Because it's a church that's declaring its plans to move forward and advance the gospel. And anytime you do that, the other principalities that are at work, the kingdom of darkness, like we're making it known that the enemy is going to lose territory in Dothan, Alabama as a result of Church of the Crossing. That the enemy is going to lose territory in the nation as a result of us partnering and being part of what God's doing in and through the local church. That the enemy is going to lose territory in the world because ultimately he's fighting a battle that he's already lost. And if we could just come around that and say, okay, God, this is what we're going to do. So here's the deal. We've been praying. I looked at the list of places that we can go. Um, the only thing that I wanted it to be was something outside of, like, I didn't want to go to Tennessee. I didn't want to go to Alabama because, like, we just live here and we can drive all over there and most of us vacation there. And so where we're going to go, and it just kind of settled in my spirit, man, we're going to uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to do the Native American Navajo tribe. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> We're pretty, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, the amazing thing is, is that, that this will really be our first of many trips to come out of this house. And so uh, the awesome thing is, is we've got the vehicle and the group to do it with. We've got the leaders that have said, John, you're not going to have to worry about it because Callie and Alejandro are going to be kind of like directing this trip for us under kind of the guidance of Jenna. And so the trip is open. To anyone who's interested in doing something, it's going to be in July. I think, did you sign us up for like July 17th or something like that? The 14th? July 14th, which is a Saturday. We'll leave that Saturday. And we'll come back the following Friday. And so uh, if you're interested in hearing more about this trip, going on this trip, Sign up at the back table. She's going to be back there, her and Sydney, with some of the information. Just put your name down. It's just an interest meeting right at first, and so we're not committing you to the trip, but we really want to build a team. Here's what we're saying. Some people have already asked, like, so what, what about students? What about kids? What if they want to go? If they are under 16 years old, the only thing we would ask is that the parents would go with them. Um, and so we'll have the interest meeting, man, and, uh, man, who, who knows what God has next for us, but I can tell you that as a pastor... Church of the Cross, and I'm telling you that we're ready enough for whatever it might be. Bow your heads with me this morning. So dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your spirit, God, for a move of God that is waiting to happen through your people, through your church. And so God, we want to reach Jerusalem. We want to reach Judea and Samaria. We 
want to reach the remotest parts of the earth, Lord. I believe that even this morning, as different as the service setup might have been, that, that you're calling people to the missions field. That you're calling people to step up and do something in the local community. That you're calling people to take territory and take a chance and go on a missions trip and to really just experience more of you through other cultures. And so, Father, we're just thankful for what you're doing in and through this church, giving us vision, giving us direction. I would never close out a service. You're like, man, like, what does this have to do with salvation? Well, the first step in doing anything for Christ is having a relationship with Him first. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so even if you're like, man, I haven't taken care of myself and made that first declaration of Christ as my Savior. Like, I want to do this, but i got to get things right first in my own life. If you're here this morning and you never responded to the saving message of Jesus, you don't have to wait any longer. I just simply want to acknowledge you as you acknowledge Him. I'm not going to call you up or ask you to repeat a prayer, but if you just slip your hand up and slip it down, I can celebrate with you. Maybe you're in here today and you're like, you know what, John? <laughs> I needed to hear about missions because I was starting to wonder what it would look like through this church. And so, man, uh, God's really stirring and He's calling me to just more local city, maybe permanent missionary work, whatever it is. But you're like, John, man, like, like that, that call, I, I just it's been confirmed this morning. Would you just pray as God continues to reveal his plans for me? Could you slip your hand up and slip it down? I want to pray for you. Thank you so much. Dear Heavenly Father, you see the response. God, to your spirit and to your heart. Lord, those that have felt a calling or a prompting to do something, maybe where they're planted, God, or maybe where they're going. Holy Spirit, I pray that you just begin to reveal the territory that you've been plowing and preparing for them to be planted in, Lord. Father, we love you and we're so thankful for what you're doing in and through the crossing. And it's in your son's name, the church says, says, amen and amen. Guys, I appreciate y'all uh, just being okay with it being a little different this morning. Next week, man, I'm super excited about the message.